Uh, folks, we really gotta talk about Trisha Paytas. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare, and we're gonna be looking at a controversial personality and veteran YouTuber, Trisha Paytas. Now, before we get too far into things, I wanna chat about what I've been learning through my Skillshare membership while social distancing at home. So if you haven't heard of Skillshare, they are an amazing online learning community with a wide range of awesome creative classes for exploring new skills, developing interests, and getting lost in your own creativity. Now, I know a lot of people might be thinking about ways to learn some new skills and diversify their careers, especially in these uncertain COVID times. So as a creator, I've been taking Creativity Unleashed, Discover, Hone, and Share Your Voice Online by YouTuber Nathaniel Drew. This has been so valuable for helping me determine my value, overcome insecurities, establish my voice, and evolve as I grow. So whether you're bored, need some extra self-care, or want to join a creative community while in isolation, Skillshare is a great resource during these times and of course beyond. And for my followers, the first 1,000 people to click the link will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritty, you can check out my disclaimer here on screen. So feel free to pause the video to read it, or you can check it out in the description below. Also a huge trigger warning here, folks. If you have battled or are battling disordered eating, please sit this one out. I have limited the clips that I'm showing for this reason alone, but in general, it could be really triggering. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out on a video. All right, let's be real. Trisha Paytas is a pretty interesting bird. She has been on YouTube since mid 2000s, which I mean, did we even have YouTube then? But to summarize her succinctly, she's often described as a textbook definition of a YouTube troll. There is nothing but contradictions and sensationalism on any one Trisha Paytas video. At times, she has claimed to be transgender, which got her in some hot water with the LGBTQ community, and has also said that she has multiple personalities, which also caused some uproar for creating misinformation about dissociative identity disorder. Now, obviously, I do not know Trisha personally or professionally, and I'm not here to deny that these things are valid and true but I only mention them to point out some of the controversy that has really followed Trisha and her content. What I do want to focus on, of course, is Trisha's diet and her relationship with food and really how that has evolved over time. Now, if we looked at Trisha's channel from about a year ago, we'll see back-to-back -back episodes of her trialing some pretty extreme fad diets. So she did the five-day water fast cleanse where she consumed, well, just water. She did an egg diet where she actually ended up gaining weight eating only eggs. And she did the Joker diet where she ate an entire head of iceberg lettuce. Now I have thankfully heard her add a disclaimer that she does these diet videos mainly for entertainment purposes and that she doesn't expect to keep weight off in the long run doing something as extreme as an egg fast. But then she kind of negates her, this is all for funsies attitude by talking about how she just really needs to lose weight. So it's probably not really clear what her intentions are. And a disclaimer like that is not gonna do much when the influencer then goes on to focus on her weight loss goals. But anyways, let's listen to what she has to say about her approach to losing weight. I, I think people who are not overweight don't really understand that we have to get this initial weight off rest, like moderation, moderation, which I do agree, but you kind of have to do a little bit more of extreme calorie counting or I'm kind of doing more or less this diet to kind of get a little bit more of a head start for, I don't, I didn't want to just like throw away this week completely. You know, you can have an off day, an off week, um, but especially when you've come through like two months, you're like, there's no turning back. I'm not gonna just completely gain it all back. No, 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 I am going down every single month. Okay, so a few thoughts on Trisha's weight loss approach. First of all, 
I am all for flexibility and the message that it's all about the long game. If you break your diet on the weekend or have an off week of eating because it's a holiday or you've gone traveling, then it doesn't mean all is lost. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It's a long game. So I think it does make sense that Trisha said she's, you know, getting a head start on her diet and doesn't want to waste this week, even though she knows she's going to be off her diet or eating maybe less healthy things when she goes back home over the weekend. Most importantly, this typical yo-yo dieting is obviously quite detrimental to your relationship with food, mental health, and physical health. But it also doesn't serve to support one's weight loss efforts either. Now, trigger warning, I am gonna talk numbers, but assuming that weight loss were a strict numbers game, which newsflash, it's not, but if it was, and you were theoretically to put yourself in a caloric deficit of let's say 300 calories a day, Monday through Thursday, that's a 1200 calorie deficit in a week. And then if you overate by 500 calories Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you're only up 300 calories that whole week. So sure, it might slow down your weight loss, but it's really not a big deal, especially if you're able to see it as not a big deal and let it spiral you into a prolonged binge. Now, Trisha did say this, but of course, Trisha is also the queen of contradiction because in a more recent video where she was eating Korean fried cheese, she says, It's my last day on November 1st, I'm starting a diet for real because I'm having music videos in December. And um, yeah, so I'm like, this is my like last craving week of stuff. This, my friends, is what we call the last supper mentality. And more than anything, this is the reason why going on these extreme diets in the first place really does not make sense. It's the idea that, hey, you know, the diet starts tomorrow, so I gotta get in all the forbidden foods right now. Back to Trisha's diet videos for a sec, because I do want to relate my earlier comments to her specifically. Now, when Trisha diets, she's not putting herself in a 300 calorie deficit and then overeating 500 calories on the weekends. She's literally not eating and then doing like a mukbang like binge. So obviously for some people, even modest caloric restriction is going to trigger a binge. But when you're not eating or eating like just eggs, obviously your body is going to rebel. Now, if she were to not put herself on an extremely restrictive diet like the egg diet or water fast in the first place, she probably wouldn't need to overeat when she went away on a vacation, for example or realistically, at least not to an uncomfortable level. Without that feeling of mental scarcity and also physical deprivation, it's easier to eat the foods you love in moderation. Now, I recognize that this may be easier said than done, especially for those with a history of dieting and restriction like Trisha. But this recommendation is really kind of just for the general population who are watching videos like hers and also who are watching mine. Now, Trisha also mentioned that people like her need to take on these really extreme diets to kind of kickstart their weight loss before they can reach a maintenance mode. I respectfully disagree. Taking on too much too fast is the most reliable road to throwing in the towel on any health promoting behaviors. Not that a water fast or an egg diet is what I would call a healthy diet, but you know what I mean. Research also suggests that this weight cycling is arguably more dangerous than staying at one's original higher weight, as yo-yo dieting does increase the risk of diabetes and metabolic syndrome, abdominal obesity, heart disease, general life dissatisfaction, and other mental health concerns. Case in point, over the past year, we've seen a departure from Trisha's kind of weight loss content to daily mukbang uploads. She's literally become the poster child of the mukbang, and it's almost always not on particularly healthy or balanced foods. So from Korean fried cheese, to donuts, to mac and cheese, to Taco Bell nachos, most of these meals take place in the car, with a camera, and maybe a few friends. Now, you guys know my thoughts on mukbangs in general. I have a whole video where I discuss my concerns. Um, but in short, I think what started out as people wanting to build a community for solo diners, looking for company at mealtimes, has basically become a glorified binge on otherwise restricted foods. 
Now, while other YouTubers I've reviewed, like Nikocado Avocado and Amberlynn Reed, have both come out saying that they do the mukbang format largely for views, because that's what people watch most, I haven't heard the same from Trisha, but of course, it's very possible I missed that from her. Honestly, there's so much content on her channel and each video is like 30 to 90 minutes long, most of which is her chewing. So yeah, it's a lot to digest. But in her most recent videos, I did hear evidence of her current relationship with food status. And honestly, it didn't look good. Let's take a look. Gaining weight loss, right? I'm going to get back to I just talked to my trainer today and I'm like getting back to it. If I eat once a day, even if it's not a great meal, like even if it's pizza, I tend to stay the same weight the next day. And if I eat around this time, which is like, what time is it? Like 3.30? If I eat around 3.30, you start getting like a little hungry and then your hunger always subsides in the morning, right? Like if you go to bed, I'm like kind of hungry, you're fine in the morning for the most part. And then I can usually kind of wait again. And if I can't wait, if I need to have something around like 11 or something, I have like a little mini cliff bar, but I try and wait till 3.30 and then it's like worth it. And then. I don't know, it, it's, it's helped me like maintain my weight. I don't know, it's like not the best thing. It's definitely not the healthiest, but. Okay, so interestingly, Trisha acknowledges that a lot of her methods that she uses for weight loss aren't necessarily very healthy, but she continues to try them out because like she said, it's worked. Now, it's really unfortunate to me that she feels that she needs to put herself to bed hungry and push herself to ignore those innate primal cues every day by forcing herself to eat only one meal. And as evidenced in some of her videos shot while intermittent fasting, usually she can't actually keep it up. Usually she ends up eating like a whole other large meal, which only makes sense because her body is probably screaming at her for more food. So while I appreciate that in her video, she often offers that disclaimer that, you know, she's not a nutritionist or not making diet suggestions. She's just sharing what she's doing or what works for her. I still do think that she needs to be held accountable here. Like, as I always say, as an influencer, I believe that we need to take responsibility for the content that we put out there and suggesting that we eat one meal a day and go to bed hungry because the hunger will subside in the morning can be really triggering for a lot of vulnerable viewers. Let's see what else she has to say. I wanted to share my first bite of ice cream with you guys. Baskin Robbins is so good. I'm very addicted to it. I look insane. I kind of had a bad day, so I went and got some Korean fried cheese. I really don't like, oh, I like hang on to things. If I have a bad day, it like I hang on to it and I just thought I deserve some Korean fried cheese today, so that's what I got. Okay, so I have discussed the science of food addiction ad nauseum on my channel here. And while the jury is out on its legitimacy from a biophysiological or clinical perspective, I'm not denying its possibility or at least the feeling or experience of food addiction being very real. What I can tell you, however, is that the media loves to talk about the mice research suggesting that sugar is as addictive as cocaine because it causes symptoms of withdrawal. But if you look at the research carefully, what this actually says is that the subjects, aka mice, only displayed addictive or withdrawal-like behaviors after they had been previously restricted of sugar. In other words, when you make sugar a novelty, you're going to obsess. So when you are yo-yo dieting, restricting yourself to just like one meal, eating only eggs or otherwise somehow feeling deprived, it seems totally normal to have these food obsessive like tendencies. It also appears to me that Trisha may be relying heavily on eating as a coping mechanism for dealing with some negative emotions. Now it's totally normal to occasionally eat emotionally, we all do it from time to time, and that doesn't mean that you are failing at eating intuitively, as long as it doesn't trigger a cycle of guilt and shame. However, when food becomes our only coping strategy, that's when it's likely time to try to get to the root of the issue and find some more effective strategies. And usually that involves actual therapy, not another diet. So obviously we don't watch Trisha for healthy eating advice. Um, and I think it's quite clear that even with her diet videos, she's usually transparent about them not being health promoting behaviors, 
with the exception of her water fasting video where she did attempt to list some of the supposed benefits. But what I do take issue with above all else is Trisha messing with a very vulnerable subsect of her following, and that is those currently struggling or those with a history of disordered eating and eating disorders. Let me explain. So I was scrolling through TikTok, which is one of my absolute least favorite pastimes of life, and I saw that Trisha had a message for her fans struggling with eating disorders. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Trish, and today I'm going to be having a donut as a snack. If you're having trouble eating your breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, or food in general today, I want to take my first bite with you, and hopefully you'll take your first bite with me. So, cheers. One more TikTok for the day. I actually really like Alicia Marie. I just wanted to make a public service announcement since my last video was garnered to people who suffer with eating disorders where they have trouble um, eating food, keeping food down, etc. I too have struggled with ED. Um, I know a lot of people like you don't look like it, but it's actually a binge eating disorder that I had to seek treatment for. And anyways, this thumbnail was triggering to a lot of people and I'm just here to remind you that no food should make you ever feel guilty. We need food to nourish our bodies. And some people may disagree with what goes in our bodies, whether you eat fast food or meat or you're a vegan or whatever. People are always gonna disagree with what goes in your body, but as long as you're feeding yourself, every food is guilt-free food. Don't ever feel guilty. Don't ever for go for these gimmicks. Your body deserves food and energy and fuel. And I hate things like this guilt-free. It's such a bad message to send young girls. So sending this out to whoever needs to hear it don't feel guilty about eating food. So what's wrong with this picture? No, it's not that she's eating a donut because Trisha eats donuts often and that's cool with me. No, it's not that she's saying that she thinks every food should be guilt-free food. I think that's actually a really great message and one that I fully support. But it's that she's literally calling on the eating disorder community, bringing this vulnerable population in calling this a safe space, and then spamming these folks with mukbangs and restrictive diet videos, both of which could be incredibly triggering for somebody in recovery or actively suffering from disordered eating. This is not okay. So to tease this issue apart a little bit more, I want to bring back my friend, eating disorder dietitian, Alessandra Magisano, to discuss some of these major themes. So thanks for joining me, Alessandra. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be back. Thank you. So I want to talk about how restriction and binging are actually so intrinsically linked, but obviously recovery is not as simple as just like eating guilt-free food like Trisha suggested. So for example, eating donuts or having like a book bang or something like that isn't necessarily evidence of recovery. Absolutely. When we think about binging and restricting being so intrinsically linked, we usually talk about it in reference to food. And although that's very important, and it's usually a, the case when we're talking about disordered eating relationships, food is used as a vehicle, um, as a coping strategy, it's not about food. So the binging and the restricting of food is not the cause, is not the whole um, value of what it means to have an eating disorder. So if we say just eat guilt-free food, these kinds of things are really dangerous because it, again, undermines that an eating disorder is not about food and what you just do with food behaviorally. It's the brain chemistry that's involved in what it means to have an eating disorder and that somebody can't just eat guilt-free food and it'll just fix them like that. There's so much more involved and it's dangerous to watch something that that's just, oh, eat guilt-free food and saying, okay, well then I can be cured just with that. It puts the onus on the food rather than what actually eating disorders are about, that they're complex, they're layered. Um, and it also makes it feel like you can't seek out professional support or um, seek individual support from your physicians and from you know your, your care team. Because if you can just eat guilt-free food, then anybody can cure themselves. People who are suffering, let's say from a restrictive um, eating disorder can easily kind of like waffle into more binging territory and back and forth. So can you discuss a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So if somebody who's, you know, you can swing back and forth because a lot of the times, actually I would say all of the time, 
the symptoms of binging and restricting happen on a spectrum. And so it's not just one um, and they kind of go in and out. And so if you start out more restrictive, you can kind of in other ways introduce some binge like um, behaviors, even without food. Like sometimes we think about binging and restricting only in regards to food, but the truth is they happen in other ways with other things in our life, um, other substances. Um, and so you kind of, if you're restricting in food, you might be binging somewhere else and not necessarily have that link and think, oh, well, like, but I'm not binging on food, so what's what's the issue? But you might actually be somewhere else and then the pendulum is always gonna swing because you're always on a spectrum. You, nobody just stays in one space right. of restricting and binging. It's like up and down and all around. Yeah. Um, right, and not to mention like whether or not that donut that you you know, eight guilt free, is that going to lead you right back into a restrictive episode, you know, the next day or whatever? So that's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. I mean, it could be part of the rules too. Like, I, I know lots of eat, eating disorders, and I've heard lots of stories that, you know, that, that there's permissible rules in within eating disorders that let you behave seemingly normal with food. But are completely disordered in their own way so that's why when you see things like oh i can eat guilt-free food you might because that's that's in in your box that feels safe but it's all within the context of eating disorders so i think this topic is really important because viewers have to know that the things they see might actually be part of somebody's um journey with disordered eating where they're presenting it as the solution when in fact it's part of the disorder. That is a really good point because it's something that I see um, with this mukbang trend on YouTube a lot is that, you know, a lot of fitness influencers, they, they restrict, they restrict, they restrict, and then they have a, a mukbang and that's, you know, kind of alleged evidence of them having a, a good relationship with food or a balanced relationship with food. But like you said, that is built into their set of that their set of, of, of weekly rules that they know that if they restrict heavily enough all week long, they can have that cheat meal and it's not going to, you know, it's not going to tip the scales too much. So they can, that's that they're allowed to do that as long as they get back right, right, right back onto that restrictive bandwagon on Monday or whatever it is. So oh, exactly. Really good, really good point. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Alessandra. You are always such a wealth of knowledge. I will of course be leaving links to Alessandra's Instagram and contact information below so that you can reach out if you're looking for some one-on-one -on -one support. Thank you guys so much. Now, in conclusion, I can't think of a lot of channels on YouTube that I think are more problematic than Trisha Paytas. Um, I actually think Trisha is pretty honest in her intentions most of the time, like when she tries out an outrageous diet for entertainment or spends a full week uploading mukbangs in full on costume. Um, this content is not really meant to teach you something. It's pretty much out there for entertainment and for shock value. I mean, I guess you could say it's trolling 101. But when she starts to offer pseudo wellness advice to an already very vulnerable population, and then juxtapose that against a backdrop of her own problematic eating episodes, that is where she crosses a line. So if you are struggling or have struggled with disordered eating or your relationship with food, I would avoid Trisha's channel at all cost. And on that note, that is all that I have today for you folks. Thank you again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. If you liked it, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on who you'd like to see me review next. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.